Session two, Europe-wide multimodal ticketing and payment systems. We're going to have two presentations, one from Yanni Akila um, of Intelligent Transport Systems, the European Commission in Belgium, and uh, Maria Rotaverta, Director of Data and Business Unit from the Ministry of Transport and Communications in Finland. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers in turn, and then I'm going to ask them to give their presentations. We have an hour for this, so we've got plenty of time, hopefully, for some Q&A. Um, so we've got 20 minute presentations from each of those uh, individuals. So to start off with, um, Yanni. Uh, Yanni joined the European Commission in 2016 as a policy officer for sustainable and intelligent transport at DG Move. He's responsible for data sharing issues in transport in the context of the Mobility Data Space Initiative, as well as multimodal digital mo mobility services, effectively mobility as a service. Yanni holds degrees in political science from Sciences Po Paris and the College of Europe. Yanni, over to you. Thank you very much and, and uh, good morning also from, from my side, from, from rainy Brussels. Um, and, and thank you, Ben, for the very good uh, introductory presentation, which touched on, on maybe all the key issues that, that we're also looking at from, from the European side. Um, let me check if I can share my, my presentation. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, we are. Thank you. Excellent. And I can also change them. Maybe maybe to kickstart, and I thought it, it was the most relevant to, to go a little bit back through the narrative on, on where our future initiatives on, on multimodal digital mobility services come from, and also looking at at um, the smart mobility pillar, which we announced in, in um, our mobility strategy, which is a fairly recent document, was adopted um, last December. So to, to give you the background, our last strategy document was actually from uh, 2011, the 2011 Transport White Paper, which also was a rather old document. A lot of things had changed in the meantime, if we think of, um, of uh, sustainability, if we think of progress in digitalization, or if we think also of the pandemic. So it needed, it needed quite some revamp. And, and one of the key, uh, the key uh, aim was to look at how can we create this 90% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions from transport by 2050 announced in the Green Deal. And so the strategy uh, is, a, is a Green Deal uh, deliverable. Um, which was adopted slightly later than, than initially foreseen because what we couldn't foresee is the, is the whole coronavirus pandemic and um, which severely hit the transport sector. And so we added that as well um, as one of the pillars. So you see in the name, the strategy is sustainable and smart, but when, one can also add that the third objective, which is uh, resilience. So the strategy itself is... Um, our vision, what we think needs to be done in, for the European transport and mobility sector. Um, it's looking at um, initiatives that we, we are adopting in the, next, um, in the next five years to an action plan of not less than 82 uh, measures. But it also looks at what we see as trends in the mobility sector until 2030 and 2050 and where we want to be. And this is the task of, of so-called key milestones. Uh, which I'll present also in a minute. There are also 10, 10 flagship areas uh, across the three pillars, so uh, sustainable, smart, and resilient, um, which are more looking at, at key, key groups of actions. And if you're interested in the, in the analysis, how we came to different conclusions or numbers, um, I can invite you to consult also the larger staff working document, uh, which explains that in detail. But as, as is mentioned, we, we built the strategy on, on, on three pillars. Uh, the sustain, sustainability, how can we achieve the 90% reduction by 2050? Um, looking at, at alternative fuels, um, looking at promoting more sustainable modes. Um, the smart pillar, which is also enabling to a certain extent sustainability. And I will come also to that pillar uh, in, a, in a later section, as well as resilience, which is more looking at how can we reinforce uh, the, uh, the the uh, single transport market. Uh, how can we make the transport sector more resilient to future crises? Um, 
future exceptional situations and also looking at, at the economic recovery uh, from the crisis. To give you a little bit of an example of what are um, milestones that, that we put forward, and I will, I will not um, go into details into all of them, but to mention a few, uh, for instance, a target by 2030 of having 30 million zero emission cars, and uh, on that num based on that number, we can we can estimate how many charging stations would need to be deployed Europe wide. Um, we're looking at having 100 climate neutral cities by that date, um, having freight transport that would be fully paperless, um, deploying a large scale automated mobility, integrated ele electronic ticketing. And to give you an example of what we're looking at 2050 is, um, for instance, here doubling f uh, rail freight traffic and tripling high-speed rail traffic, um, covering the um, external cost of transport, so basically internalizing the external costs, as well as um, bringing down the death toll for all modes of transport in the EU close to zero. Previously, you may have known this as our vision zero for road transport, so we have enlarged the scope to include uh, all the modes as well. To, to briefly go into the the, the three pillars and what they're aiming to do. The sustainable pillar is really looking at how we can shift to, to zero emission mobility. And here there are, there are maybe three, three objectives. It is that ev every transport mode modes has a contribution to make. So there are measures to make all the transport modes more sustainable, but also um, looking at how we can promote more sustainable modes uh, to, to a multimodal system where it would be easier to switch between modes, both for passenger and, and freight, as well as the right incentives to drive that transition. And there we have five uh, flagship areas. Um, flagship one and, and two are very much looking at, at vehicles, fleets, stations, um, basically uh, reducing um, the carbon emissions on, on that side, looking at deploying alternative fuels. Flagship three is about urban mobility. Here we'll also have an urban mobility communication coming up, if I'm not mistaken, still this year. Flagship four, looking at, at greening freight transport and flagship five on, on more the behavioral aspects. So carbon pricing, better incentives, the, the whole question of, of the carrot and the, and the stick. If we look at, at resilience, so as I mentioned, it's, it's really about reinforcing the single market. Um, recovery from the, from the crisis and making it more crisis proof um, for future cases, as well as uh, increasing investments um, also to enable the, the sustainability pillar when it comes to infrastructure and fleets. Here we have three flagship areas. Um, so the single market aspect, which I just mentioned, which also include um, competition and state aid questions, making mobility fair and just for all. This is the question of transport workers, um, attracting more young talents to the sector, attracting more women to the sector. Currently in the EU, 22% of transport workers are women. Um, but also looking at accessibility and, and passenger rights and our flagship 10, which, which now includes um, all the work done on safety and security. Now coming to the, to the smart pillar, and I will develop this maybe a little bit uh, more in detail. Here we have um, four objectives in order to create a more seamless, safe and efficient uh, transport system. It's first of all to enable multimodality, seamless multimodality, uh, and their um, multimodal digital mobility service play a, a very key role. Um, supporting sustainable choices, and, and here we can think of, of using vehicles in a more, in a more optimal manner to, to automation or, or also providing the user with better information on the sustainable performance of, of their journey. But it's also about technologies of the, of the future, getting those right and, and having the, the right conditions for these to, to flourish. Um, but with everything with digitalization, there's also, while there are new opportunities, there are also new challenges. And, and so we also need to look that we, we manage to keep those challenges in a certain way in check. We have two flagships in the smart pillar. The first one is flagship six, making connected and automated multimodal mobility a reality, which is covering the, the two first objectives I mentioned. And here, some of the key initiatives we're looking at is revising the Intelligent Transport Systems Directive this year, um, 
revising the delegated regulation on multimodal travel information service. I'll come to that in a minute, as well as our possible new initiative on multimodal digital mobility services, which I will also talk about in a minute, as well as actions to support connected and automated vehicles. And, and all the three uh, bullets um, are all uh, dependent on the ITS directive, which is a framework directive, which allows certain specifications to be adopted. Our flagship seven is more looking at uh, new technologies, um, notably questions of, of data and artificial intelligence, um, which is very much, um, which very much needs data in order to, to function. And, and this covers the, the two latter objective of the smart pillar. And, and here, some of the key initiatives is we will um, establish and renew r &I partnerships in key sectors, notably, um, our CESAR partnership in uh, air traffic management research, um, a, a rail partnership, a partnership on connected and uh, cooperative connected and automated mobility. We are also looking to develop a common European mobility data space, which would make um, data sharing in the transport sector easier, pool the data from, from different existing data databases so we don't have the, the current problem that everything is stuck in their own silos, which are plainly uninteroperable, as well as working on, a, on an um, artificial intelligence roadmap for, for mobility. Now coming to closer to the topic of, of today, um, to, to give you a little bit of an overview, what is the, the current framework? And, and um, Ben, you, you, you refer to this in, in your slides. Um, we have since 2017 um, specifications under the ITS directive on EU-wide multimodal travel information services. And, and so it's a rather recent delegated regulation, 2017, no? which um, also implies that there are still some deadlines to come. Um, there are gradual phases by which uh, provisions apply uh, and the final deadline being in 2023. So there's still some steps to go. What uh, this delegate regulation does, it um, ensures the compatibility, interoperability and continuity uh, for deployment of information services. And one word which is, miss which is missing here is um, across borders. So the logic behind EU intervention is that we want these information services not to stop at borders, but also to enable um, EU-wide uh, journey planning. How is it done? Well, basically we ask member states to set up national access points, uh, which are central um, uh, contact points or data registries for data. And it only applies to data that is actually collected and available in machine readable format. So, Basically, it's a, it's a specification. It cannot go beyond that and say that you need to uh, create data. It only looks at data which is, which is already there and trying to make that uh, fit a, a certain format. And, and what is that, that format um, is basically what you see here is that if we want to push for, for better journey planning services um, across the EU, it means that we need to link the, the local, the regional, the national, um, the national services. And um, what the, the delegate regulation does, it looks at um, different types of data. So it has an, an annex where you have a long list of, of static data, um, that is um, uh, timetable data, location data, data on fares, data on accessibility, and this is the data that transport operators should contribute uh, to, the, to the member state national access points. And there also the national access points, they can take very different shapes. So this is the second box you, you see here. It also specifies um, certain sets of standards to be used um, for that data, uh, notably making use of transmodel and the two um, the two standards that derive from Transmodel, namely NETEX and, and Siri, uh, which, which are uh, rather complete, uh, complete ontologies. But there are some exceptions. For instance, in aviation, you can use um, documents defined by IATA and in rail um, standards or technical documents defined in, in TAP-TSI. 
so um, the technical specifications for interoperability for, for passenger transport. It also um, specifies under which conditions um, this data can be reused. So this can be either done by a, a, a license agreements, but it can also be open data. It, it sets um, what, um, what are the quality criteria, um, what are the terms of conditions of access, uh, and also the um, what what can can um, an oper uh, can an operator ask a fee, and and there is a certain level of fee that that can be asked. So these are the different requirements that are currently set in that legislation. And now coming back to the strategy and, and linking it all together is that we are working on an initiative on uh, multimodal digital mobility services, and the aim is to create a a clear EU framework for deployment of digital mobility services, both within and across modes, um, with the objective to increase the, the seamless multimodality, to be more inclusive, as well as to, to push for more sustainability. And here you see a, a small four-piece puzzle of the different uh, of the different actions we're looking at. The ITS directive, which is being revised. Um, which will look notably at where do we have currently data gaps, um, what are things we currently don't address, and this is something that will come this year, and is also for the delegated regulation um, very important because this is the act that enables uh, specifications to be adopted. We are also looking to set up um, rather sooner than later a multimodal stakeholder expert group um, to which we will invite all, all key stakeholders to, to contribute because we will need uh, your expertise uh, in order to, to help us um, prepare the, the two other uh, legislative initiatives uh, foreseen for 2022, which is for one, uh, a revision of the delegate regulation and a, a possible new proposal uh, for development of multimodal digital mobility services. And um, we have also have a golden opportunity because as the strategy is revising quite a lot of actions, I, I mentioned the, the, the number of, of 82 measures. We, we have two measures coming up, um, notably to revise the TAP TSI in rail, so the technical documents applicable between um, the data exchange between rail operators. Uh, as well as the computerized reservation system code of conduct in aviation. So we are able to, to align also those developments um, with, uh, with the multimodal initiatives, which is, which is a key opportunity to, to go a little bit further in, in this respect. To, to say a few words on, on maybe part three and, and four, what we're looking at in the um, revision of the delegate regulation is... Um, as this is more the technical part of our initiative, um, looking at, at mandating new data types. For instance, one key data type, which is currently not included in any annex, is vehicle occupancy. Um, vehicle occupancy wasn't really an issue a few years ago. With the pandemic, it becomes a crucial data type. We're also looking at possibly mandating um, certain dynamic data to be, uh, to be made accessible. Um, as I mentioned currently, uh, the delegated regulation only looks at static data, but we are looking at um, at increasing the scope to possibly include, for instance, um, dynamic fares or seat availability, which are also uh, crucial pieces of data to promote um, the reservation uh, booking and, and ticketing. Um, in that regard, we're also looking at strengthening position, provisions related to data quality or so-called um, linked data. But this is still uh, under, under working. As you can see, um, the, the foreseen adoption date is around Q3 2022. Um, to accompany that, uh, and this is, this is part four, we're looking at a possible initiative on, um, on market aspects to support multimodal digital mobility services. And this is something we're working together um, with, uh, with our rail colleagues, uh, me coming more from the multimodal side. And here we're looking at um, commercial agreements between the transport operators on one side and the services reselling mobility products or, or digital mobility services, where on both sides, there, there are quite a lot of concerns. Um, 
there are occasionally issues which which hinder the cooperation. Sometimes it can be uh, abusive marketing clauses. Sometimes it can be that the uh, public transport authorities have the feeling that they don't have the control over these digital services. Uh, we, we are also looking in, in this regard to look at um, limiting discriminatory behaviors. And, and this is all subject to the impact assessment to see to what extent we can do that. And also um, ensure that the multimodal digital mobility services um, provide more information on, on sustainability. So basically if the user um, information on the sustainable performance or, of their journey, or for instance, include um, walking and cycling um, alongside the other option, or um, has a certain transparency of ranking um, as for instance, often the most uh, polluting modes um, are the ones that, that have the highest, um, have the highest uh, commissions and which are often the ones that are promoted uh, in the ranking. So this is all something we are, we are looking at. And also a key thing to mention here, as we'll, we'll hear from Maria in a minute uh, on, the, on the national context, uh, the case of Finland, is that ideally this framework um, would, would complement uh, the national frameworks. Um, there are some in place in, in France, in the Netherlands and Finland and basically create a basic EU layer that would support um, multimodal digital mobility services across, across the EU. Maybe to conclude, um, this is all still work in progress. Um, we, we are currently launching all the, all the necessary assessments and therefore um, I would very much invite you to, to stay put for when we launch the call for the multimodal stakeholder expert group, as, as this will be a key venue to have to have the key discussions and to pre prepare these initiatives so we can make, uh, make the most out of them. And at this point, uh, I will conclude uh, and uh, I'm available for, for questions if you, if you have any. That's really brilliant, Yanni. Thank you very much. Really insightful and great to see the, the progress that's being made here. Some interesting points here. Soren raised that MDMS is uh, another step towards open mass, which I agree with. Um, I'm going to hand over to Maria in a second, but just to introduce Maria. Um, Maria is the director of the Data Business Unit at the Ministry of Transport Communications in Finland. She's responsible for the strategic development of horizontal data economy initiatives and regulatory framework. In addition, Maria looks after data utilisation in the field of transport and logistics. At the EU level, Maria has fostered policy measures for a human-centric, thriving and balanced data economy. During Finland's presidency of the Council of the EU in 2019, data economy principles were drafted to guide policies and regulative development in the EU. These principles are well reflected in the recent EU strategies and initiatives, especially in the Data Governance Act and the anticipated sectoral data spaces. Maria believes that by releasing the power of data through an interoperable EU-wide internal market and infrastructure for data, which also addresses the need to empower citizens to manage their data, we can enable broader digitalization as well as innovation and technology such as automation and AI for the benefit of people and societies. Um, Maria, it sounds like you've got some fantastic experience to share with us. I'll hand over the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, and, and uh, hello to everybody. Yes, we have been drafting the resilience and recovery plan for Finland. So digitalization is uh, all over us at the moment. So very topical uh, discussions here. I hope my presentation shows to you. So I will be beginning by saying that with the COVID-19, we have actually tackled the biggest obstacle we have, that is the change in mindset. So I believe that we now can really vision a truly digital society 24-7, functioning and serving the needs of the people and the businesses in Europe. So this is uh, something we kind of uh, can take now as, as granted, and we don't have to make this transition is talks anymore about what could it bring if we could really operate digital, not to use cash money in our vehicles, not to um, be, be in need for, for digital information for, for smooth transport and so on. So, so this is now behind. So the key initiatives, how we see it, and we welcome and are delighted of the level of ambition as well as the level of concrecy 
in, in both of these fields. So the sustainable and smart mobility strategy is very well balanced. And we also see that the data strategy as a horizontal layer on the data market provides uh, kind of the, the, the supporting structures, how we can build a data-driven uh, uh, sector-specific uh, transition to digital. So as Jani already mentioned, uh, the data and mobility, what we expect from the EU in the forthcoming uh, year or two, uh, are the big deliverables uh, kind of uh, competing the work started with the intelligent transport systems uh, regulations so, so or the directive. So when we began, we were talking about multimodal travel and ticketing information services, but the ticketing was taken off. Uh, so we have been working with the travel information as well, but now we see that the ticketing part of the um, travel chain is equally important and it is the kind of the kind of the product that we uh, can deliver for the citizens and for the use of, of mobility services. So building common European mobility data space, building the interoperability layer is crucial for getting the cross-border functioning of of services and data, but uh, along saying that the mobility data space is important, we shouldn't forget that uh, also supporting the, the, the lives of people and the citizens of EU in all of their uh, areas of life. So it's not only in mobility that we have to move forward, but also the other sectors as well. And in, in that work, the interoperability issue raises its importance. So, uh, these are what are expected and what we see is that the regulations are one of the three main corners when we are building a balanced data sharing environment. We need the regulations to confirm to our companies, to businesses that this is the way forward and it is safe to invest and develop. So, so certainty for investment is crucial for getting uh, kind of the innovation uh, smoothly operating. Then we, of course, need the technical interoperability layers, and that is um, partly maybe from regulations, but also the soft measures, as, as already explained, uh, what kind of uh, tools we need in order to deliver the, the interoperability. And there are a lot of uh, agile measures, so we don't have to do everything at the same um, same same kind of systems, but we just need to make sure that they uh, discussed together, they are interoperable in, in all different levels. And what is important is also to support the development of business models. And in this, I think the, the, the work is big, bigger in, in urban transport than it is, for instance, in logistics in, in the mobility sector, because in, in public transport, we have a lot of public money and private investors are, are looking for business model that would function also in the urban mobility context. So the building a neutral playing field for all kinds of uh, players is, is crucial in getting the investments, the market running and, and developing. So what we expect from the deliverables in data sharing landscape is of course the availability and quality and interoperability of data also the sharing and utilization of data with common data governance models, but also a regulatory environment that is not going to be any more fragmented. So it has to address the needs of open data, the, the government to business data, uh, data held by companies, so business to business data, business to government data, and also the personal data dimension. If we don't tackle the privacy issues from the, from the root, then it, it, it will be uh, very complex to add a, later, a layer that will take away the privacy concerns. So privacy by design has to be in all what we do in mobility, especially in mobility, because it's a, a data that uh, highly, highly sensitive or highly, highly personal. So there's a complete uh, slide also on the trust and uh, I think, uh, Trust is also something that you have seen uh, when we have moved to, uh, to digital working, digital, uh, digital operational models. Uh, the, if we lose trust, it's very hard to gain it back. So 
So building also security by design is important when we are talking about data services for mobility. So also against cyber threats and breaches, but also uh, making sure that um, people using the solutions, providing data services are well equipped to, to deliver a safe and, and trustworthy environment to handle data. So we need also third party uh, possibilities to audit the level of security and we need also to create mechanism that goes beyond only the maybe the ticketing or payment system security. We need a broader uh, consensus on what kind of uh, security is expected so that we can have a reciprocal uh, recognition also on, on the products, the services cross-border cross within EU. So then how, how maybe the European data governance inflects is that um, we now see that there is other sectors as well alongside mobility. So, so finance, energy comes into mind at the first. So we need to also take this cross-sector uh, interoperability into account and build uh, generic models and, and specifications. So learning from other sectors as well which we have done also in Finland when we have been establishing our ticketing regulation. So getting data on the move, FRAN terms maybe cannot be emphasized too much. Uh, so the terms have to be fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory. The data doesn't have to be free or it doesn't have to have no, no terms, but it has to be fair. And then of course we have to kick uh, access rights to data uh, in order to create the uh, access to services. So how we will do it, uh, first is uh, looking into the mobility scene uh, uh, and, and make sure that uh, transport automation and ITS are in the same picture as well as logistics along with passenger services and also looking that the horizontal data economy layer is along. But the easiest way to uh, kind of get the uh, solutions that uh, serve the people is to go human centric and empower also the citizens to utilize data and to be uh, data operators rather than uh, data subjects. So this is important to take into consideration because the citizens are those that use also other services around their, their daily lives. And then we need to look at the global level Aviation, maritime, they are global. We cannot build only EU-specific uh, standards. And it was already mentioned that we need uh, translators maybe to turn data sets into European language, but the uh, global dimension has to be taken in board. And then of course, the legislation that works for all. But then coming to the data sharing, how we can regulate the data. As already was mentioned, we need uh, static and dynamic transport data. So I will go directly to how we could do that uh, by using as an experience the Finnish uh, regulation on, on mobility services data. So in 2017, we established a two-phase uh, regulatory uh, framework, the Transport Services Act, where we obliged, uh, made it mandatory for every operator, whether taxis or public transport service providers, to open essential data on mobility services via APIs. So data in uh, structured format. Uh, over 11,000 operators have uh, fulfilled this uh, requirement by day. And then we required also that the anonymous single tickets uh, so the non-personal data ones were requested to be open through uh, APIs for third parties. And this uh, was affecting the road and rail transport services. Uh, as thought that uh, aviation and maritime are too tricky because of the international dimension and also because the uh, personal passenger information is part of the ticketing in those modes. And after these phase one regulations, we also requested that data that is generated as a history data should be communicated back to the officials so that we can also uh, make sure that we have the right data to make uh, procurement decisions uh, and give it to authorities back when they are preparing their transport planning. 
So getting some kind of mechanism to guarantee the business to government data is equally important. But then we also requested opening the seasonal tickets, the student and senior discount tickets. So tickets that were related to some kind of an account. So you are a customer to some service provider. So those service providers needed to open their APIs. Uh, and by consent, uh, a citizen can allow that uh, some mobility uh, as a service operator or third party can use those tickets to formulate their uh, transport chains. And this two phase uh, kind of a regulatory model was then uh, also supported with soft law measures and, of course, some funding for administrations uh, working with public transport. Uh, as a total in Finland, we use about 1 billion euros a year for public subsidies in, in public transport. So we, uh, we consider that uh, uh, requesting something in back is uh, uh, not only reasonable, but also a uh, very smart move uh, in making this a nationwide so that you can travel along uh, the whole nation with uh, uh, ticketing products for the whole chain. So maybe the, 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 what we have achieved, the plus uh, sides are the interoperability and the, of course the mobility services can be now built and the tr trust that is now built within the system uh, and with the interaction is, is generating good results. And uh, the problem now is that uh, Finland, of course, if we would have the world's best uh, transport legislation, it doesn't help our companies or citizens to enlarge to neighboring countries or the EU market. So we wish to, of course, have the roaming aspect and the European wide and the globally wide scalable uh, service um, basis for service. So also the business incentives uh, with the highly publicized business, it's very hard to build a model where half priced tickets can compete with the full price ticket so so this kind of mechanisms need still more addressing so what we see is that uh, we need to open uh, the, the chains <laughs> to fu fully utilize the potential of digitalization and data and therefore uh, uh, seeing that all modes are on board passenger transport and logistics the same way urban and non urban areas as well as uh, European transport corridors and mobility hubs as a good starting point, point for, for building these uh, mobility chains. And what we see that also the mobility market requires is uh, opening standards and trust, trust, creating trustworthy practices. We need uh, the fund principles for accessing data and ticketing, and then we need the neutrality between different operators, and this can also be affected through regulating data. A few slides and one is just to not to forget that you can use citizens as active data uh, integrators uh, and not just passive subjects and I think the COVID uh, tracing app, the COVID green certificates are now a kind of a product where we see that uh, you can actually bring interoperability through European level, which uh, just slightly uh, uh, affecting the kind of the operational models that each country has. So you can build the interoperability layer using smartphones or the using citizens accounts uh, in a hugely easier way than maybe has been anticipated before. And also there are a lot of uh, uh, options where you can you can bring the citizens and the, the user better managing their data so that the GDPR uh, is not compromised. And therefore what we, we see would be uh, kind of the wish list from the EU would be that uh, we make the backend connectivity uh, the must have so that we have a real time possibility for validation and authentication uh, of tickets and therefore we have the roaming possibility and also requirement to facilitate the third party sales of ticketing uh, through APIs. So, so opening the market for the best one to win the 
consumer trust. And this is not away from the original operators. This is only added uh, selling uh, of their products. But of course, there's a, there is a lot of issues that need to be tackled along. And also bringing the individual data portability rights along so that uh, individuals can choose their operators and service providers because without competition, we don't have innovation. And without innovation, we don't have a business model that uh, generates um, more competition. So this is a loop we are entering and we wish to have a dynamic and balanced uh, market for mobility. So what we expect is that we push towards the future with innovation friendly and future ready regulative framework and, and we are ready to build it together with all of you and then hopefully we will have an active two years ahead of us. Thank you. Maria, thank you. That was a really interesting presentation. It's really great to see the work that you're doing um, in Finland on this really important topic. Uh, I think I, I referenced it in the um, in my presentation, but uh, I think you're certainly um, one of the leading um, countries in this space around making data interoperable and open. Um, I'd like to ask um, attendees if they have any questions to put to the panelists. We have 20 minutes um, of Q&A time now uh, for, for the panelists. Um, but I suppose I, I, whilst people are thinking about that, and please do um, put them in the Q&A or indeed um, uh, in the chat functionality, um, I'll ask a, a quick question um, before we kick off, um, which is that do, do you think that mobility as a service will, will happen organically? Um, do you think the data sharing will, will happen organically or, or do you think there needs to be more in terms of regulation to, to open up ticketing and uh, payments to enable mobility as a service to happen? And, and Maria, I suppose I'd like to put that question to you first of all. Yeah, well, we believe that uh, we just wait. Uh, nobody is daring to make the first move. So we, we discovered that in Finland that we took everybody, all the stakeholders to one room and we asked who should make the first move, the big ones, the publicly owned ones, or, or everybody. And everybody said that everybody. <laughs> so we regulated that everybody opens certain uh, Certain, certain data and certain, uh, certain requirements so that it's a level playing field and neutral for all. So that functioned. Otherwise, we would be still be waiting who would take the lead and open the first one. And even that, we would uh, achieve a non-balanced approach because they would be like the biggest ones uh, growing their mass and the smaller ones getting outside. So we need to also see that the possibilities for European business are equal for all sized of businesses in digital economy. Great, thank you. And, and Yanni, the same question to yourself. Um, maybe there to mention that the, the, the Finnish model on a European level is, is quite advanced with to that because I mean, uh, in Finland, they have opened um, a part of the payment APIs for, for, for all the operators, which on the other hand, in, in other countries, for instance, France is a, is a completely different model where uh, they have rather looked at empowering the, the, the public transport authorities um, to, um, to, to manage uh, the different mobility as a service applications and also the, the, more, disruptive, the more disruptive companies. So the, the, the question on whether you can, what can you do with regulation really depends on, on the different contexts that, that we have in different uh, EU, EU countries. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to move to the Q&A questions now. And, and the first comes from Lucas Malik. Um, and he's asked, talking about cross-border traveling, it will require a common attitude to providing information about fares, stops, etc. Will the Commission promote the idea of common European standards for that level of metadata? And, and Yanni, I think that's probably a question to yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's a multifaceted question because as such um, we we have um, common standards so those are the the ones from the transmodal family netex and Siri um, for for if you think of, of timetable data if you think of fares data or distribution channels which basically try to set common definitions 
and and basically at a very wide level um, among all the European countries have the same words of what different things mean. The the whole reason why the transmodal family was was created was that uh, at the time when you would speak of a stop place, it would mean completely different things in, in different countries or if we speak of, of platforms. So there's a huge bulk of the work in, in, in that has gone in defining what do different things mean and now gradually coding coding the uh, the uh, existing systems uh, into that standards. Um, for timetable, that's fairly easy. When it comes to um, fairs, there are, there are thousands of different fairs uh, where, where it becomes a lot more complicated at the European scale. And, and uh, Ben, you mentioned the word metadata. This is also something that we're looking on at the, at the national access point level, because today you can put uh, contribute a data set to the national access point, but you don't really have to describe um, what what map projections it has used or, or other kinds of information, which which hopefully will be tackled by the common European standards uh, once they are they are fully implemented. Uh, but this is still a very much a concern we have. Thank you, uh, and, and yes, I can I can completely attest to that. Even with bus open data in the UK, uh, trying to get a common lexicon of affairs and what's meant by a singular return a, a daily uh, is is a very very difficult thing. And then trying to do that across Europe, I think, is going to be a challenge, but certainly not insurmountable. Hopefully, um, there's a, another question here from Michelle Yearly, who who asks. It takes so long to develop these standards, and typically by the time they're released, they're, they're outdated. Um, so, so what can we do about that? And, and Maria, I, I think this, I'll put that to you first, if that's okay. Yeah, maybe a little also echoing the, the last co comments that uh, we don't have to do everything interoperable in a European context, in a cross-border context, or even in a city cross-border context. We can use the, create some kind of minimum interoperability and provide the basic products uh, in a digital means so that we can build the transport chains that are vital from airports to city centers, from there to taxi, so that uh, me as non-French speaking person can also navigate my way through the different um, electronical ticketing systems. I've been kicking uh, validation machines, <laughs> vending machines in, in, in Germany as well, because uh, the directions to buy a certain ticket are too complex. You have to know the stops and so on. So building this kind of uh, easy uh, solutions first, so standardizing some kind of uh, uh, easy designed uh, chains of transport for no normal ticketing or the basic priced ticketing and then bringing the, the children and, and elderly and some other discounts later on maybe but you don't have to do everything at once so so be more agile in what you deliver and, and providing the interoperability for the commoners first so I think that is uh, where the masses also move so that is something that could be achievable. Great thank you. Um, I think uh, just a sort of a reflection for myself that uh, I think I think it, it is a challenge. Um, I think having uh, sort of a, a baseline is really important, and then um, the, the elements on it. So we, we have a, effectively a, a common dictionary and a common architecture in terms of the standards themselves, uh, and then there are things that will evolve as we go through time. And it, it's about having the agility, and, and there will be localizations in those as well. I think we need to be reflective of that things aren't necessarily going to be um, absolutely consistently adopted in the same way but as long as you're able to describe how the differences have occurred that's the most important thing. Um, I think I'd like to turn to um, sort of a, a question from uh, Narenda here to uh, Tiani uh, before I come back on on Maz in, in Finland uh, with Maria but uh, Yanni uh, so we talked about a payment mode could be a drop across borders and yes, of, of course it can when we think about things like EMV and um, you know, clips, uh, etc. But how can we make fair com computation borderless? How do we make enable a fair to be uh, calculated both in in two countries and, and applied? Um, and you know, do we need 
you know, especially where you've got different regulations in different countries around things like Competition Act and, um, you know, state aid and a whole range of subsidies and a whole range of other things. Do we, do we, will we have, apart from obviously interrailing and things like that, will we have more cross-border fares and how do we make those um, sort of viable? Um, so, so it, it's also a, a very, very long-term ob objective. And, and unfortunately, um, the, the first step that, that we have taken is, is to make sure that the, the fair information um, across Europe comes in, in, in the same formats. So we're able to, at least for, for static fares, um, have a common layer of um, of what is meant by different things, and and to 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 be able for the reseller to to compute uh, to compute it that way. Now, if we if we look at dynamic fares, um, this is something that will always, or in in all the cases I could think of, require going to uh, the operator server and making making the different. Uh, making the different calls and, and recovering those prices. So the, the, the fair computation as such would still remain with the, with the operator unless you start um, accumulating the fares across different offers, which would be then rather on the side of the, of the um, digital mobility service. But it's all a little bit um, still work in progress. Huh? It's, it's very much dependent. Do we have common standards? And and then we can gradually look at at, uh, at payment APIs or look eventually maybe one day further and look at mobility accounts, not having 10 different different uh, public transport cards across country, but having having one interoperable account. Great, thank you, Annie. I'd like to turn to um, a question from Soren to um, Maria, please, which is, we've now got sort of the regulatory environment in place for open APIs for ticketing and payments. Um, but what are, from your perspective, what are the stumbling blocks we've still got to overcome? What are the blocks that we need to address to enable MAS to really take off and accelerate? Yeah, well, uh, of course, the biggest obstacle is that uh, when you have the half price half-priced uh, public transport option, it's very hard to build the business model on top of that because uh, if you give uh, some uh, some part of that money to a mass operator, then it's uh, actually uh, the municipalities need to pay a little more to, to cover the, the, the deficit. So it's a non-sum non <coughs> play at the, at the moment. So, so we have to kind of... Uh, Think about a little outside the box. Uh, what what are the what are the alternatives? Uh, it was mentioned that France they do a, a certain kind of, of solution, but even the French businesses cannot, uh, if they procure for the municipality, uh, they cannot scale. So so all, they also need something that is. Uh, uh, bought from the from the market to be utilized in French, and the same product has to be available to be sold also for German or Finnish uh, authorities for public uh, transport uh, ticketing services, for instance. So, looking also on the business to business level, what kind of interoperability requirements uh, there are? It doesn't have to be very complex. It can be a QR code for validation so that you can actually only uh, concentrate on, on the user interface, not needing to um, provide everything that the public uh, authority or the public uh, transport service provider has to offer. So, so letting uh, those businesses room to innovate by providing what they need for their business and, and concentrating on, on those uh, operators building the roaming and interoperability on top of all the good things we have already in place in cities and, and in nationwide usage. So, so seeing it as a layer, not as an integration that you have to dig very deeply in the system. Thank you, Maria. And um, I think it's an interesting point. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, I think we've kind of covered in some of these discussions that uh, do we think that some cities, some transport authorities or operators uh, impose the use of just their app and ticketing systems, um, you know, the ownership of the customer approach? I, I, I think that, you know, that, that, that is a challenge. It, it really, uh, you know, in the UK, if you sell a rail ticket uh, digitally, 
um, on behalf of someone else, you get a five percent commission. Now, five percent is quite a lot of money. Um, you know, if you're looking at a one percent commission and you're on a one and a half percent margin as a private operator, it, it's a lot of money. So, I, I do think that there are there are challenges here, commercial challenges to overcome in this um, in this ecosystem. Um, and I think that it's it, you know for, for me there's a real need to focus on the governance and the commercial models for MAS uh, to get those working as as well as worrying about the technology I think a lot of people launch into if we create the APIs people will come build it and they will come and, and clearly without that commercial model underpinning it that's that's going to be a, a key challenge um Yanni I'd, I'd like to send you another question here uh which is how do we enforce compliance with standards so things like the transmodal standards um and you know, how do we ensure that um operators and authorities are really um uh, applying this and, and indeed you know the, the, the mobility service providers and app providers mm -hmm. which is a which is a very good question and i i think also here this is a little bit of a of a question of of prioritization um as the, the, the text, um, the delegate regulation is, is rather young, um, our enforcement efforts have gone first into um, uh, working with the member state to set up all the, all the national access points. And, and here we still have some member states which, which haven't done it. And that is basically the first priority. Um, the, the subsequent step, and, and this is actually only a work that can be done um, once the, the whole delegate regulation applies as of, as of 2023 uh, is, is to look at um, the, the compliance with, with standards, but there it's also the role of actually member states to, to enforce those standards. Now, if we have the, the revision uh, coming up at the, at the same time, um, it, it will very much pave the steps after 2023. Uh, so this is also a, a question we, we um, we may look at uh, in, in that context um, for, for the period after the, the current delegate regulation on, on how can we further enforce the compliance with those standards. Thank you, that's, that's a really helpful uh, response. Um, we've probably got time for one more question and I'd like, I think this is actually linked to that question around uh, how do we ensure that everyone's actually adopting the standards, but where there's a cost to doing so, um, you know, that may be quite significant upgrades to back office or even front office infrastructure. Um, and for, for smaller operators who don't necessarily have the capital to do that, um, how do we make sure that we're, they're not unfairly being penalized for this or, or indeed that they're being given uh, the right incentives uh, to enable them to make those investments to adopt the standards? And um, uh, Maria, I'll put that to you first, if that's okay, then come back for Yanis. Please. Yes, well, we have used a different kind of options. So first we have the regulation requiring uh, that the, in pro procurement situations, the public transport operators uh, need to purchase only back-end supported systems. So that is now effect. Uh, so the new ones, so we don't invest money for the old school ones or the legacy systems. So building everything uh, the smart way from, from this day on. And then the second is, of course, we have used uh, climate mitigation money to, to develop certain uh, digital ticketing systems and interoperability layers. We have also encouraged in, in getting money from the EU funding and, and, and building a project uh, with neighboring countries and, and piloting as such. But also the business side needs to be developed. So innovation money, is available also for businesses building digital solutions for the mobility market. So there's a wide variety of, 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 of pushing and pulling and incentivizing and also using uh, tools as um, we have these uh, city contracts where we are looking at housing and, and transport together and we oblige the cities to put their data in good shape. So having the data for the stops or addresses or the city street so in a good shape so that we will we can build all kinds of mobility services on top of that data so it's a lot of work but uh, of course we do work every day so doing the things right at one time is of course uh, saving us money actually. Thank you Maria and, and Yanni same question to you. Mm -hmm. Maybe building on 
on what I what I previously said on, on prioritization, it, it really depends on, on where at, at what level is, is, is the member state. Because um, I mean, uh, in, in, in Finland or in other countries, um, the, the work is, is quite advanced. There are some member states which are still setting up the national access points. So they were looking if we can have some data sets available, whatever the standards are. A um, lot of member states which currently still uh, publish only data, for instance, in the in the GTFS format, and then are, are slowly looking to to implement the more complete NetEx format, which would then allow more, more complex fares, translations, and so on. So, so it's a it's a gradual process. Um, also, to mention, for instance, the the Norwegian example of of Entour, where um, they have gone quite widely to to implement NetEx as the as the as the reference standard, and and maybe to also um, look at another angle of this of this topic is that um, the public transport operators have been very adamant that um, they have also very small margins also when it comes to to technical adaptions and and there the question of payment apis has has been something that that has been quite often raised as a as a particularly costly uh, costly point yes thank you so still still work to be done here to, to make sure that it's, it's uh adoptable but i think you know the the general view i think is um be clear on the pathway and um give people time to adapt and adopt and as you said Murray, i think really good point around making sure that we're buying the right equipment and the right solutions um yanni maria i'd like to thank you both very much for your both your presentations and the responses to the questions i think it's been really insightful and great to see the work of finland and the, the european commission in this space so um, with that, I'll uh, hand back to Narasa and thank you very much for your time again. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. And thank you, Yanni and Maria, for that very interesting uh, session.